Yeah, well, the, the thing is, Simon, that uh, for the last probably 15 years, I've been mostly doing newsy, current affairs-y type phone-in programmes and, you know, talking to a huge number of people. Candidates knocking on doorsteps will all say, ah, yes, well, you know, we've heard what the people have to say about this, that and the other. But I've been in a very privileged position in that literally, you know, hundreds, thousands of people have phoned up the programmes that I've been hosting and complaining about things that they don't like. Uh, and that's a great way of finding out what people really think think about things and i think it's the the world is a crazy place these days and people don't know what they can and they can't say and you know the words that they've got to use and all the rest of it and i think that we need some common sense now and i think that you know that's what people have said to me over the years and again countless people over the years have, have listened to the program or taken part in it uh, in the programs that i've been doing and saying why don't you run for politics because you talk common sense so if i've got a usp it's the fact that you know i'm, I'm knocking on a little bit i've been working for 50 years non-stop um, in lots of different industries as well and I've been talking to lots of people so you know I think I've got a finger on the pulse of, of what the real issues are not the ones that the media would make us think are real issues. Now taking back control from the political elite now that suggests you believe things are out of control what in particular? I get the impression and you've got to remember that uh, over the course of this last parliament i've not really uh, had much to do with the politicians themselves but it strikes me that we've had um we've had an administration that is dead set on controlling the flow of news i think there are probably more journalists employed by government now than there are by the, the entire manx media um, and it's a case of massaging stories and making sure that the message that everybody's on message it seems that, you know, the, the veneer of respectability of certain of our ministers uh, cracks very quickly. You know, the mask falls off and you see what's underneath. Witness the comments by the chief minister only a week or so ago about, you know, we, we give, uh, the government gives Manx Radio a million pounds a year and yet they're still asking pertinent questions. Well, you know, that, that's not what you want to hear from a, a democratically elected government. Uh, the government is answerable to the people. And uh, and I've got the impression very much over the last five years that we've got a government that is a little bit uh, controlling, let's say. And once people are elected, they tend to forget the people who've elected them. Most people say that the only time they ever see an MHK is, you know, in the run up to an election where somebody will knock on the door and beg for the vote. Well, that's not democracy, really. So, you know, I, I, I think that the political elite... Peter Caron always used to talk about a one-party state by patronage, and he was absolutely right. You know, that's what we've got. The Council of Ministers runs the Isle of Man with the civil service, and uh, uh, accountability seems to go out of the window. Witness the number of, of grandiose schemes that we've had that have just gone horribly, horribly wrong at the cost of tens of millions of pounds to the taxpayer. But you're standing as an independent. That's one in twenty-four. Um, it does. It doesn't give you carte blanche to, to to bring through what you want to do. Are you going to find that frustrating? No, I, I actually see that as a strength because an awful lot of people who are standing. And this time five years ago, I was doing what you are doing now, which that I interviewed every one of the new candidates for Keys. And every one of them came in with a big manifesto about how they were going to change the world. And I did say to a few of them, are you sure that you're going to be able to do any of this? You're just one of 24 people. And, you know, you've got to get uh, people on side within the House of Keys or within Timwall to do anything at all. So it's pointless promising that you're going to fix this or you're going to fix that. So I'm very aware of that. The difference is I've listened to a lot of, of candidate interviews and everybody's got an idea about which department they'd like to be in and all the rest of it. I don't want to be in a department. Uh, I don't want to have a boss in the Council of Ministers. Uh, I want to be 100% independent. I've not got any financial backers. I'm 100% uh, an independent candidate. And certainly for probably the first six to 12 months, I expect to be a backbencher and I expect to hold the executive to account. Were you not tempted at any stage to align yourself with any of the political groupings on the island? 
Not really. I can see benefits in all of them. And I've spoken to uh, a lot of people, uh, again, either through the job or just on a personal basis. Uh, so I've, I've spoken to a, a lot of people who are involved in political parties in the island. And I can see strengths and weaknesses in all of them. And I don't want to be tied down to somebody else's vision necessarily. Uh, again, it's a case of being completely independent and listening to i'm not always guaranteed to to follow uh what the people of middle want to do but i want to give the people of middle more of a stake in politics i want to have regular meetings so that we can discuss things and um so no i, I think it's uh, I, I think it's important you say you want to be in touch with real people what are real people Real people are, I think that 95% of people in the Isle of Man are nice, genuine, honest, decent people. And the trouble is that, you know, if, if you read the newspapers and I read all the websites uh, or the news websites pretty much every day, and the picture that you get is that everybody's fallen out with everybody else. You've got all these identity groups. You've got everybody getting offended by proxy. Not about something that somebody said that offends them, uh, but something that they've heard somebody say that might possibly offend somebody else, so therefore they're offended by proxy. And it's a nonsense. It's all down to identity politics. Real people, 95% of the Isle of Man, I think anyway, Decent people just want to get on with their lives with, with the, the, um, the, the slightest interference from government. Uh, they want to keep as much money in the pockets as they can, not be paying for vanity schemes. And, uh, you know, they're, they're what I call real people, not the people who go out protesting necessarily, not the people who are making a big noise about identity politics issues. Real people. Now, free speech is, is, as you say, of great importance to you. Now, you found yourself challenged in this respect not long ago of a comments made on it. Has, in your view, society's uh, desire to protect specific groups had the effect unintentionally maybe of undermining free speech to a degree? It, it, it's absolutely undermined free speech. Everybody uh, in the public eye now has to be incredibly careful what they say. And that's not a bad thing in some ways. Nobody wants to set out to offend anybody, any group or, or person. Nobody wants to do that. However, one has to be able to question things. And you're absolutely right. I've fallen foul of, of the social media mob, as I like to think of them now, three times over the last five or six years. And in each case, I said something fairly innocent, trying to uh, generate a debate, and somebody heard something that offended them by proxy. And you end up with a big pile on at that point. Uh, I joined the Free Speech Union 12 months ago because of the problems that I had. Um, and, you know, considering that the people who were protesting about me wanted a more tolerant society, you know, they'd be better fit to the, uh, the, the Salem witch trials, to be honest. It's ridiculous. We've got to be able to discuss things. We, we've all got differences, and that's fine. I love hearing the other person's point of view, but at least we've got to be able to ask questions. And nowadays, that's getting more and more difficult. On another subject, you are, I think it's fair to say, a self-confessed petrol head with a love for cars and flying. Where do you stand on green issues? Um, in the front room of the house, really, watching the telly. Uh, <laughs> green issues. I was not convinced about the whole thing of climate change right from the start, and I'm not a climate scientist, or, uh, although uh, I did have to do a meteorology course as part of the pilot's licence, so I've got probably a better idea than a lot of people about how the, the planet works in that way. Um, but... I wasn't sure about this whole climate change thing because I think the first we heard of it was Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth. And I think that every single claim that he made in that film has since been disproved or he'd overstated the case by a factor of 10. I mean, ridiculous. Uh, my position on that now is that, OK, I accept that climate change is happening. I'm not convinced that it's man-made. And I'm certainly not convinced that mankind can do anything at all about it, especially in the Isle of Man. Now, if we've got policies um, that make the air cleaner, the water cleaner, that reduce pollution, that reduce waste, I'm all for all of those things, as any right-minded person would be. But let's not talk about spending 20 million quid a year on investigating climate change in the Isle of Man, because, you know, our contribution to it, if, it, it is absolutely infinitesimal. Let's spend that money 
money instead on giving people grants to put ground source heat pumps in or to uh, insulate the house or to put triple glazing in. That's where any money that the Isle of Man government's got should go. What would you say is the view on the street, though, from the canvassing you've done so far in relation to green matters? Is there as much enthusiasm for the green agenda as maybe the media and the government would tell us? I don't think there is, no. I think an awful lot of people look at this as another example of identity politics. Um, It tends to be people on the left of the political spectrum who are making the most noise about it. Um, But to be honest, you know, anybody who listened to what Greta Thunberg had to say and was convinced by it uh, needs to have the bumps field as far as I'm concerned because, you know, she, she's a, a girl, a teenage girl who's bunked off most of her uh, school, the secondary schooling, uh, to protest about things that her parents feel strongly about. She's apparently got Asperger's syndrome, which predisposes people to obsessive compulsive behaviour. And so she's been made a poster girl by, by the Green Issues lobby. And I think it's unkind. And, and why people bow down to her and, and call the same Greta, I just don't understand. Now, you have three children. How concerned are you, though, about the state of society in general and its direction of travel for them? If I was to make um, a list... I'm too old to worry about the, the about my world uh, because I'm probably not going to be here for that long. Uh, but I do worry about my children and I do worry about my grandchildren. And the thing is that if you draw a list of the top 20 things that you worry about for the future... Climate change comes pretty much to the bottom of the list. There are far more uh, pressing concerns, I think, than that, Uh, and things that we need to address, not least free speech. I mean, if we can't debate things rationally and fairly with people, then society's over and we've turned into some sort of a totalitarian state. Now, we're emerging from the COVID pandemic. Do you support the easing and the imminent removal of border restrictions? I'm not uh, an expert on on things like COVID, uh, and I listen to what the experts say because that seems to be the best option. I also know an awful lot of people don't buy into the whole COVID thing who think that it's some sort of a, a global plot or whatever, and I can see a point in that. But, you know, you, you've got to look, uh, look at the odds, really, and to me, the odds were that if I caught COVID, I'd probably die, and therefore I've had two jabs. Uh, In terms of of easing, I think we've got to the stage now where pretty much everybody's been vaccinated, uh, or certainly everybody who's at risk has been vaccinated, and I think that the borders need to be lifted. I mean, the the trouble is that I think David Ashford said that we're we're getting to a phase now where we need to learn to live with COVID uh, and not try and and keep it away from the island. I think it's... it's, uh, a fact of life now, just like the the seasonal flu, the winter flu was. Now, your three or three of your main priorities listed are tourism, affordable housing, and roads. Uh, what order would you list them in terms of urgency? Um, I I'm not sure to be honest. Um, th- there are a number of things that bother me, and the you know as they come up, then I'll address them. I don't know that I could prioritise the list. I mean, most of us, you talk to most people on the Isle of Man and you say, what annoys you most? And they'll say the roads because they're absolutely disgraceful. But there are a whole list of things that that need to be sorted out. Now, I'm not going to be able to sort them out on my own, but I'm certainly going to be able to, if elected, draw attention to them uh, and keep the spotlight of scrutiny on the people who are paid to do the jobs for us and, and, to be honest, haven't been doing a very good job over the last five years. Where do you stand on the structure of Tinwald? For example, should the Legislative Council be popularly elected and, and are there too many MHKs? I don't know whether or not there are too many MHKs. I, it, it would be very easy to say, yes, there are too many MHKs, uh, but I think that uh, the uh, experts have decided over various reports that the number's about right that you need a certain number of people to fill positions within government. I think the Liz Vane report said that you didn't need as many people to be serving on departments, and I think that that's probably right. But it's not the... I mean, 24 people, yes, it's ridiculous if you compare it to most areas across. Um, But we are a nation as well, so you're not just dealing in parish pump issues, we're actually dealing with, with national issues as well. LegCo... 
I think should be uh, popularly elected. I think that nobody should be allowed to become a Legislative Council member until they're at least 50 years old. I think that they should have been before the electorate uh, in the past. Um, and it shouldn't just be a jobs for the boys kind of a thing at the, within the gift of the chief minister, which seems to be the way that it was last time. We've seen a situation in which I think around eight local authorities have seen insufficient interest from candidates to require uh, an election. How worrying is this, do you think? And do you consider that standing for a local authority before seeking national office might have been a better route? Maybe, yes. I mean, I... I... I didn't really have the, the time to do that, or the inclination, to be honest. Um, I think that the local authorities do a good job. I think that there are all sorts of arguments for maybe local authority reform. Uh, I think that there are probably economies that could be made. I think that a lot of economies have been made over the last few years. Um, but there, there are probably a, a lot more that could be made. I'm not an expert on local authorities. Of the current administration, are there anybody? Is there anybody in particular that's impressed you? In the current administration, we've got some good people in government. I think Laurie Hooper has done a good job as a backbencher. I think the people who've impressed me most are people who were in ministerial positions who stood down from government to become active backbenchers, because I think that that takes an amount of hootspah. Um, and both of them, I'm thinking now about particularly Chris, the two Chris's, Chris Thomas and Chris Robertshaw. Um, they were both sort of senior uh, minister level, and both of them stood down because they thought that they could serve democracy better that way. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that that's, that maybe says a, an awful lot about the limitations that anybody who accepts a government position has put upon them. If you are elected, would you be happy to serve within uh, a department of government in Aust? Not for, like I said earlier on, I, for the first six or 12 months, no. I think I can probably do more as a backbencher, but never say never. Uh, and that's not be me being coy and saying that I want to be, you know, the, the uh, Air Vice Marshal for the Manx Air Force or anything like that. Uh, it, it really is a case of I want to see whether or not I'm right in that being an active backbencher is a, a, a better fit for the talents that I've got. Um, if I decide after six or 12 months, once I know where the, the staff bathroom is and all the rest of it, uh, that some sort of a position would be worthwhile and, and would be of benefit to the people of middle, I would consider it, but certainly not for the first six to 12 months. And finally, in a nutshell, why should people in middle vote for Stu Peters? Because it's a voice of reason and because I'm a new voice as far as politics is concerned. Uh, there are other candidates and I'm, I'm, I've got no comment to make about any of them, except that you need to look at people and decide whether or not they're part of the machine at the moment uh, or not. And I would think that we've probably got two candidates out of the five who are already part of the machine of government. And we've got three people who aren't. So it's a really simple decision. If you think that government has served as well over the last five years, then maybe you need to vote for people who are, you know, already part of the establishment. If you think that we need change, and I think that we need change, then vote for, for me and uh, other people who are currently outside the political